Kenichi is the Vice President and Chief Technical Officer of Transportation Solutions for TE Connectivity, which in layman's terms means that he is responsible for making our cars and vehicles more high-tech and connected than ever before. Alan grew up in Detroit, Michigan, so his love of cars runs deep. He turned that love into a 30-year career at Chrysler and now doing incredible things with TE Connectivity. Throughout his decades in the industry, Alan has not just seen the transformation of cars from simple machines that get us from point A to point B to highly intelligent vehicles that can drive themselves. He's been a part of making it a reality. In this episode of IT Visionaries, Alan and Ian discuss everything from how Formula E racing informs consumer car technology to the future of autonomous driving and more. Enjoy this interview. This podcast is sponsored by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. Salesforce just introduced the Lightning Platform Mobile, the low-code mobile app development platform that empowers anyone to easily build, publish, and manage AI-powered mobile apps for employees and for customers. Find out more at salesforce.com slash build mobile apps. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at Mission.org. And on the other line across the country from me, Alan, what's going on? Hi, Ian. Good day. Yeah, it is a good day. And this is going to be a fun episode. This is going to be a little bit different from some of our other episodes because we have so much kind of fun IoT and transportation technology stuff, which we don't always get. So this is going to be uh, really exciting. You've had a long career at Chrysler and at now at TE Connectivity. So before we get into all that, How'd you get into technology? Well, Ian, I grew up just outside Detroit, Michigan, which is probably the basis for my love of cars. And my career began as a development engineer at Chrysler. And from the start, I've always been involved with developing technology to make cars smarter, cleaner, or safer. And during the time that Chrysler was called Daimler Chrysler, I lived and worked in Stuttgart, Germany, working at the Mercedes Technical Center. Later, the company became named Fiat Chrysler, and during that time, I was appointed the head of electrical engineering, and I worked both in Detroit and and Turin, Italy. A lot of twists and turns during that uh, automotive portion of my career. Now at TE Connectivity, my role is CTO for Transportation Solutions, and this is more of a strategic role to ensure we recognize the macro trends, we develop the right technologies for our customers, and ensure our engineering teams have the right tools and capabilities and processes to keep us in the cutting edge and, and maintaining our advantage over our competitors. What does it take to produce this highly engineered connectivity and these sensing products and like connected connected vehicles and all of that? Like what, what goes into all of this from kind of the technology perspective from, from your lens? Well, it takes, <clears throat> it takes a lot of engineering capabilities. Um, we have a very deep technical team here and, and we get uh, involved with contact physics. So we understand the, nature of contacts and plating and um, that electrical interface at the microscopic level. But we also have expertise in things like resins. So we do a lot of molding of plastics. And then in the sensor space, we have a prototype line in Fremont, California, so we can actually develop our own sensing elements. And so if you put all of these together, it creates a really broad portfolio of products. So we can do connection systems for automobiles and for aerospace and for defense. We can do high voltage connection systems and cabling for electric vehicles like a Toyota Prius or a Chevy Bolt, for example. Um, We can do sensing elements for driver safety or for the mining industry or even for medical. So it's really a broad portfolio of technologies that we put together to create all of these products for connectivity. I mean, it, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, automobile technology obviously is, has changed a ton, especially in the last 10 years. Back in the day, the, the coolest thing you could do is, is maybe there was some talking, maybe some, uh, some heads up display or, or something like that. I mean, how have you seen kind of the technology change what cars can be with, you know, sensors everywhere, cameras everywhere, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi? Like, what does this you know, that we talk about the IoT, how do vehicles play into, you know, the, the broader IoT landscape? 
Well, the IoT space for automotive is really interesting. That's really in the connected car space. And so uh, this is the notion of <clears throat> my vehicle can have a cellular connection. Today it's 4G. In the future it'll be 5G. But it'll be connected to the cloud. And I can access from my car, I can access cloud services that could be for entertainment purposes or it could be for safety and security purposes. So, for example, if I, if I happen to be in an accident and my airbag is deployed, certainly this connected car can notify the emergency safety services so they can deploy automatically ambulances or wreckers or some type of emergency response system directly to me without having me have to dial the phone or make some type of connection. So that's a really interesting space for this first responder getting to the scene of an accident very quickly. But there's also the, there's an entertainment notion with um, cloud connectivity. So I can get certainly songs and I can get certainly services, but also the notion of being connected to say loyalty services. So my car is running low on fuel, for example, and the car knows it, it can read the fuel level. But it also being connected to the cloud, it can say, hey, I know that you're a loyalty customer of a particular gas station, and this gas station is just 10 miles down the road and it happens to be on your path that you're navigating to. And by the way, I can offer you a discount on gasoline if you take this, if you go to this particular gas station. So there's this whole potential for an economy, kind of a IoT economy that could be involved with connected cars as well. This is also the notion of I'm driving by Starbucks and they know that I'm a Starbucks loyal customer that they could offer some coupons for something that I'm interested in that space. So the, the whole car connectivity opens up some interesting opportunities in terms of, of say, uh, the car being uh, a part of the, of the IoT. But connected car do, does some other things that are really interesting too. Um, there's this notion of over the air updates. Today's scenario, I have to drive to a dealership to get my car repaired or perhaps even updated or, or uh, new software for my radio, for example. With over-the-air updates that now we're seeing in the industry is, is cars can be updated overnight with the customer's acceptance, and no longer do I have to go into a dealership that this is done in, in my home. And now I get to enjoy a new feature or an improved feature without having to take the car to the dealership. So these are things that have been in the uh, cellular industry for smartphones for a while, but now we're starting to see them deployed in cars, for example. And kind of beyond that too, I think what's so interesting is that the way that it can connect with your phone, obviously, is, you know, with AI, with the, you know, increasing focus on AI and predictability and actually your phone can track, you know, every single place that you've been in a given day. But it also, I think the self-diagnosis and being able to send you push updates and reminders and things like that, where it's saying like, hey, do you remember that you needed to get your brake pads fixed? You know, sometime you said you were going to do that this week and like push notifications. I, I think w there's so much confusion around, you know, car engines and, and a lot of people just, you know, you want to take it into the dealer and you don't necessarily know what's wrong. The fact that it could send you those updates to your phone directly and you'd have a more transparent picture, I think is pretty exciting. I think that's a fantastic application is on my, my smartphone, I can get a diagnosis from my car, which could be delivered on a monthly basis. And it could simply say that all of the monitored systems are green. So everything's okay, no worries. But also certainly being able to diagnose the car so that the driver, the customer has some knowledge going into the dealership, actually knowing what is wrong rather than just taking their car in and knowing that something isn't right. I think it's interesting too, is one could make appointments, so you can actually schedule appointments with the dealership to say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna bring my car in next Tuesday, and then your car is connected to your smartphone, so that automatically goes to your, your calendar or your outlook, so that you know, you know this is already on your calendar. Um, I think that's an, you know, an interesting play as well. But certainly, providing more information to the driver to say, look, we have self-diagnostic systems. We can figure out what's wrong with your car. This needs to be fixed, but it's not urgent. Or this is, this is critical. This is a brake problem, and you really should get to the dealership now. I think that's very useful to a customer. So with all of the kind of connectivity pieces of everyday vehicles, like our standard use vehicles, there is a lot of it is around things that kind of like improve our lives, make our, make our lives better and all that sort of stuff. 
But with the shift to electric vehicles and like high performance vehicles, you've worked on some pretty cool projects, specifically with TE's partnership with Andretti Technologies. Can you share more about like what you were working on and the, and the type of stuff and the type of broad reaching technologies, I guess you could say? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, racing is a really interesting environment, and whether it's internal combustion engines like Formula One or if it's electric vehicles like Formula E, it's a, a very harsh environment. So the vibration profiles that you'll see in a race car are 5 to 10x that you'd see in a passenger car. And the temperatures that you are seeing are much higher in a, in a race car than they would be a passenger car. So you're really pushing the envelope of the performance of the systems and the components in the car. And so a part of the game is, is having very robust components that, you, you know, that you're able to put in the car. So higher temperature, higher vibration, impervious to solutions and fluids. So I mean, that's one of the interesting things that you see in, in race cars. And certainly some learnings that you get from racing, you can apply eventually to the consumer, to consumer vehicles. So if you think back about 70 years, Jaguar was the company that really introduced 12 volt technology. So 12 volt batteries or 12 volt electrical systems. And that was done in the late fifties in their racing program. And then prior to that, all the batteries were six volts that people used in cars. So there's the, one of the early instances of technology coming from the racing industry. Another one is um, disc brakes or vented disc brakes, and then eventually ceramic brakes. So these are really high performance materials that allow the heat to transfer very quickly that provide great braking. And, and so you'll see them on race cars first, and then you might see them on uh, consumer performance cars like Ferraris or Corvettes or, or very high performance cars. But it's kind of a natural is um, you do your, your prove out in the racing space, and then eventually over time they can migrate to the passenger car space. So in addition to some of the high voltage things we're doing for the for electric vehicles, we're also involved in some of the wireless technologies. So improvements we could make to antenna designs so the driver was constantly in contact with the chief engineer so they could get telemetry to and from the car so they could get voice to and from the car. So uh, that was an, kind of an unexpected area, area that we could help with the, in the racing. I think also, um, you know, racing is all about performance. So speed is all about making sure the car is as lightweight as possible. So you have the, the most, uh, so horsepower per weight ratio is really an important factor. And so you're always looking for weight reduction opportunities. So can we provide connection systems? Can we provide cabling? Can we provide sensors that are lighter than the competition that provide a little bit of an edge for the race car? So every ounce really matters in, in racing. I remember when the first electric cars were coming out, I mean, I mean not first, but the, the first like mass produced electric cars that one of the big things was just about performance. Like they just weren't fast enough for people's liking. They're like, Hey, if I'm going uphill on a freeway, freeway entrance like can i get up to speed fast enough and all this and then years later you have formula e cars that you know can do 140 miles an hour and more using only battery powered engines what was it like to be part of that transformation oh that you know it was a heck of a lot of fun it, we, we saw with the the early formula e racing the race was broken up into two parts so each driver had two cars and so the driver would start in one car and it'd be a traditional start of the race and and you go approximately 50% of the duration, and then the car would come into the pits. The driver would step out of car number one and go into car number two, which had a- No first. way. Yeah, and they would finish the second half of the race in car number two. So this was true up until uh, season four, which was just completed last year. For season five now, they have, they have a higher capacity battery, and so now the car can run the entire, can run the entire race in, in one car. So this is a combination of a higher capacity battery. There's some strategies in terms of managing your power during the course of the race. Then it's also low, lighter components, so you take some weight out of the out of the car, so you can get you can get more range out of it. So, but and this applies exactly to a passenger car environment. I mean, so consumers are a little bit concerned about electric vehicles in terms of range anxiety. Well, the number one impact in terms of range is probably the size of the battery, but the second item is reducing weight. So it's really important we are very careful about 
you know, taking as much weight out of the car as possible. And that's why you'll see uh, the advent of much more aluminum in passenger cars. You're starting to see even carbon fiber, which is a uh, directly from the racing environment. It's a very high performance, but very lightweight material. And by taking weight out of the car, you can increase your range and you tend to lower that range of anxiety that people have about about electric vehicles. And no, they're really not golf carts anymore. I mean, there's tremendous amount of torque in these electric motors. You're getting zero to 60 time in the, in the, you know, just above two to three seconds. I mean, really high performance uh, machines that kind of blow your socks off. So I think people are most surprised by the performance you get out of electric vehicles. Yeah. I, I think people are, are very surprised. I think there was a, a long time there where it was, kind of the green movement for lack of a better term of these were way better for the environment. And therefore here's your options. You had these three, like you said, golf cart kind of varieties, but now you can see, you know, bigger vehicles, you know, SUVs, all of these sort of things. And it's just really exciting to think about pushing the pace of that innovation and what, what can we do? You know, what does 10 years, 20 years, 50 years down the road, like you said, we were, you know, using six volt batteries for a long time and then going to 12, what types of innovations are happening now on the front lines that can really shape what consumers across, across the globe use? Well, a couple of things. So the range of electric vehicles now are getting up into 200 and 300 miles, which is really interesting. I mean, this is well beyond just the daily commute. This is more than just the 40 mile commute to and from work. And then I pull, pull into my garage and I plug in and I charge overnight again. So it's much more interesting in terms of range. I can really drive my car for most of the day and I, I can come back and I really don't have to worry about lack of charge. And so really the two things that are being pushed is, you know, can I get larger batteries into the car? And so I have to offset that with weight in some fashion. Uh, but the other area is fast charging, which is really interesting. And so yeah. can I duplicate that experience of driving to a gas station and 10 minutes later I have a fuel tank and I can, I have a full tank and I can drive away. And this really facilitates cross country trips, you know, so now I'm not just limited to this 200 mile range. So that's really the next big challenge in the industry is, you know, how can I accomplish quick charging? How can I duplicate that gas station experience? And so the industry hasn't solved this yet. There's certainly some solutions and we're getting to faster charging. There's, uh, you know, Tesla has supercharger availability. Other car makers are also working on fast charging as well. And so it's, it's, it's challenging because when you pull into your house at night and you plug into your 120 volt outlet in your garage, it takes about eight to 10 hours to get a full charge of your car, which is really not viable if you're traveling uh, cross country and you're just stopping at a rest station or stopping at a gas station to refuel. So it requires really a different technology. So instead of AC charging, uh, these fast chargers will use DC charging, which is really not available in your home, but it could be done in a commercial basis. And then the voltage, you know, you're not talking about 100 or 200 volts. You're talking about 600, 700, or maybe even up to 1,000 volts on these DC chargers. And then with this high voltage, you have to really manage. It's all about managing temperature as this, this cable, as you charge your car, will get rather warm. And so it's really a matter of how much current I can get into the battery without overheating it. So it's a bit of a complicated problem that we don't have solved yet, but certainly have improved the the uh, have reduced the charging times now and uh, it's a matter of time you know we'll get there we'll figure it out i mean one of the reasons why we were so excited to to have you on the show is this intersection of the physical world the electrical world and now cloud and and the the software side of things and one of the biggest areas for this is in autonomous driving can you share what you're working on right now with connectivity and sensor solutions around autonomous driving yeah, sure. We'd be happy to. And maybe a little bit of perspective. We came from computing platforms on cars. So, so today's uh, electronic control unit on a car will have a computing power of about, uh, say, 10 or 15 MIPS. So MIPS MIPS is a, a kind of a yardstick we use in the industry. It means millions of instructions per second. And it gives you a relative feel for the computing power of a microprocessor. So today's cars have about 10 or 15 MIPS on a single ECU. So for autonomous uh, driving, the new compute platforms that are being developed are measured in something called TOPS, and that's 
trillions of operations per second. And uh, for the purists, there's a difference really between instructions and operations, but it does give you a feel for the orders of magnitude greater in the computing power of autonomous drive systems as compared to computers on board today. You're talking about tens of thousands more powerful compute systems for autonomous driving than we see in cars today. And so the amount of software that goes into these high performance compute platforms can be uh, really mind boggling. So it's a very complicated problem to solve that is uh, autonomous driving. And it's probably the most difficult problem that in the, the history of the 100 year auto industry is how do you make a self-driving car reliable and repeatable and you know actually better than the human driver? And so while we have these very high performance compute platforms, they're connected to a series of sensors that are on board the car. So these sensors are radar, LIDAR, of cameras and ultrasonics. And, and all of these sensors on the car are generating um, data that is used by the, the autonomous drive computer. But in addition to this onboard data, there's also offboard systems providing like traffic and safety information and weather. And so this data is also coming into the car. And these autonomous drive compute platforms need to aggregate all of this data and then process it in real time. And this is, a, this is a terrific challenge to do. So think of a scenario where your car is driving and the, the LIDAR, the cameras, and the radar all detect an object in front of you. And the question is, is that object a sewer cover, a curb, a trash can, or is it a person? Your decision is very dependent on, on what you discern. I mean, if that's a person in front of you, you're going to make sure you veer to the right or you pull up and stop. If it's a sewer cover or a curb, you might just change your direction a little bit, but you can continue driving. All of this has to be processed real time. And you have the data coming in from the onboard sensors and the offboard sensors as well. And it's really, it's really a big problem. And so all of this data has to be aggregated. It has to move around the car and has to be processed in real time. And you say, well, okay, well, how much data is this? And is this really a big task? Our colleagues at Intel are suggesting that autonomous cars will generate four terabytes of data per car per day. And this would be equivalent to about 250 CDs. Of That's incredible. <laughs> it's an incredible amount of data. And, and quite honestly, uh, the, the onboard networks on cars today can't handle that. Our IT systems really can't handle that amount of data. I mean, it's, it's really an incredible challenge. And so one of the challenges we're seeing in this autonomous car is creating these high-speed networks that can move a tremendous amount of data in real time around the car very quickly. We're expecting that these networks will be 1,000 to 10,000 times faster than the networks that are on today's production cars. So this is an area that TE is working in, is, is high-speed data networks to support data transfer for autonomous vehicles, for example. Where does the talent come for this? I mean, it, it's, it's really interesting. I, I had the opportunity to sit down with the CEO, Udacity, a, a couple years ago. We were talking about kind of the, the driverless car nano degree and the things that they were working on. And just as one of the things that they saw that was such a clear market opportunity for just how many engineers are going to be needed for this type of problem. But when you kind of hear all the facts about how much more complex it is, I mean, it really drives it home. Like, where do you see the talent pipeline for these type of engineers and developers? And and, it, and you need all the different kind of like, it, it seems like it's 15 different skill sets that need to be working on this problem. It's not just like, you know, one software developer like jamming away on code. <laughs> it, it, it's an incredible problem. Like, like I said, this is the most difficult challenge the auto industry has really faced. And so you've, you've got a couple different spaces involved. So... When you're talking about high-speed data networking, we're looking within TE, we have a data and devices team, and, and this team works on, on high-speed servers, and they work on um, you know, fiber optic connections. So they're working in a much faster, maybe a little bit less robust environment in terms of uh, environment, but very high-speed data that servers and, and uh, networks would use. And we draw on that capability to bring that into automotive and say, okay, we can use we can use a similar technology. We need to make it a little bit more robust for the automotive environment. But really, this is a, a tremendous software challenge in that 
So if you think about uh, when I started in the auto industry some 30 years ago, the game was 80% hardware and 20% software. And it was all about microprocessor performance and how much RAM can I afford? Because compute power was expensive and, and memory was expensive in, the day, in those days. And so it was, you do everything in hardware and then you've got a little bit of software running this ECU. And today it's com the tables are completely reversed. You've got these very high performance compute platforms. The game is now 80% software. And so can I devise the control laws that govern all of the use cases? So, you know, what happens if the car is driving and I see orange cones, so no longer can I follow the, the route that's in my map, I have to deviate that and follow the cones. Or what happens if there is a bus making a left turn in front of me that normally most passenger cars can't make that left turn? So you have all of these use cases that you have to create laws that the autonomous drive engine is supposed to follow. So you've got this, these use cases that you have to deal with. And then you have to develop this in software to say, okay, now I've got to code these use cases into a very complex software package that, that can manage all of these different use cases and they can manage all of this data coming into the compute platform. So it is, it is really an incredible, really an incredibly complex effort. And then you get into the notion of, you know, did I execute that software properly? Do I have some bugs in the software? Did I really create reliable software? And then I have to go through and do verification of this software. The whole verification of autonomous driving is, is an incredible effort in, in and of itself. And so you'll have uh, some examples. So the California, let's see, California Department of Motor Vehicles was keeping track of the number of autonomous vehicles driven in their state. This was interesting. This could provide some insight into you know, how much testing is really going on. The data is a little bit older. It's from 2017. But you had a company like Google that had 350,000 autonomous drive miles in the state of California in 2017. And the next closest competitor was at about 125,000 miles. So it kind of gave you a relative position of the number of miles that were driven. But when you get into a laboratory environment, it takes many, many more miles to really verify the software you, you're using is reliable. And you're talking about, can you do lights out testing 24 seven where I can capture about a billion miles or maybe even 5 billion miles of, of lab testing. So it's, it's an incredible development effort. The verification is really needs to be very robust. So it's, it's quite a challenge, quite honestly, Ian. Yeah. I mean, so our studio is in Palo Alto. And so I see Waymo, I mean, I see Waymo vans every single day um, where we are, even in San Francisco and Oakland and, and kind of all over the Bay area. I see, I see those Waymo vans all the time, but specifically in Palo Alto, we see them all the time. And it's interesting to just have these, and I'm, I don't know offhand if, if those are live in terms of like, I don't know if those are all test vehicles or, or if any of those are, are actually like live, but it's interesting being in a place where they're constantly testing that sort of stuff. We're, we're right down the road from Google. It's remarkable. I mean, you see them cruising around all the time. And, you know, it's interesting, too, is there's some, some little things you would encounter that are kind of funny. There have been some complaints about autonomous cars, self-driving cars tend to be slow. And so you have to ask yourself, well, do you want your autonomous car to obey the, the speed limit laws? And they may feel like they're slow because they're actually obeying the speed limit where the rest of the drivers may or may not be. So, you know, all of these things are programmed in. I mean, it it's a little bit more difficult to say, well, I'm, you know, I'm allowed to go five over or should I actually go the speed limit or such? So, and there are a lot of little nuances. Like when I make a left turn, what is the tra trajectory of the car? And does it feel like a natural left turn? And those are kind of little things in the big scheme of things, but it's really about, have I encountered? So all of these Waymo cars that you see running around Palo Alto in the Valley is, have they encountered a use case that hasn't been seen before? So whether it's the orange cones or it's the bus taking a left turn or if it's um, weather, or if it's a traffic accident that you need to avoid. You know, they're really looking for these use cases that haven't been encountered before, and that's where the real learning occurs. So I, I take that use case and say, hey, I've got to consider that. So I've got to build that into the autonomous drive platform to be able to handle that case. I would guess that testing for weather, this would not be the hotbed, or maybe it is the hotbed because there's never any weather. Um, never have to deal with snow or ice or uh, 
rarely rain, uh, although it's been rainy this in the past couple months. But when you start to add snow and you know, massive amounts of snowfall and all of that stuff. I think obviously the states in the Southwest and, and Texas and California are going to be the areas where this stuff gets rolled out in the largest scale, obviously, as you, as you said with California and um, with how many Google has, but that it's like you said, it adds exponential, exponentially more complexity every time you have all of these outside elements that get added in. Uh, sure. And even thinking about the sensors you have uh, on an autonomous drive car. So you'll have radar, so radar and then LIDAR, which is uh, similar to radar with light. And then you have camera technology and then ultrasonics. In a heavy snow or if you have some debris covering the camera, is now you can't, you know, now you can't use your camera until it's cleared off. Or radar is certainly better at penetrating some weather than LIDAR, for example. So, you know, I think by starting out in... Um, in fair weather climate, you try to solve the big problems first, and then you get into, you know, how do I solve this weather problem? Sure. There's some other interesting, interesting things in terms of, so we talk about fully autonomous cars, and like in some of those Waymo cars that you'll see driving around, they may or may not have steering wheels and may or may not have pedals. And so there are some intermediate steps that uh, some of the automakers are taking, which is, say, semi-autonomous cars. So this is the notion that, I still have a steering wheel, I still have pedals, and there's going to be a period of time where the, the car has, the autonomous drive system has control of the car. And so you'll be driving, or, you know, driving along, and at some point, there may be the need to transfer control back to the driver. And so this could happen, um, say, for example, uh, very severe weather or rain, or if one of the sensors or systems fail, or, for example, the lines that are painted on the side of the road, that, that they, they fade and you can no longer see them. And so the cameras lose their, their lock on that. And so if any of those cases occur, the car is going to want to transfer, transfer control back to the driver. And uh, before it, it does that, it really needs to make sure that the driver is, is ready to, to assume control. So you're talking about adding uh, driver-facing cameras. So you can look at the driver to say, does it look like he's awake? Is he alert? You know, is he ready? There could also be uh, biometric sensors that one could add to say, you know, measuring the heart rate or some other metric and say, hey, is, is this driver really ready to accept the control of this car back? Because I'm, because I'm running out of gas here. I can, I can no longer see the lines. I have to do something. And, and so that's a whole, you know, that's another level of complexity that you really don't have with this fully autonomous car with no steering wheel and no pedal. So, you know, it's an interesting um, additional complexity, this semi-autonomous drive. Yeah, when we, we, we did a mini series on future cities and I interviewed the head of, head of autonomous at Lyft and then the folks at, uh, at Lime and then Emily Warren at Lime, who's their head of communications. And it's interesting to see how many different like use cases there are once you remove the steering wheel it completely changes like what like a car could be and where the seats are how the seats are like every single piece of the entire car can then be redesigned into something totally different potentially and it's just it's kind of a mind-blowing thought experiment i think it was at ces last year or maybe it was this year that they had uh, kind of like a, a competition to create as crazy of like internal designs for what cars could look like. And people were coming up with, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of interesting stuff of how you could reimagine like the height and the distance and, you know, what seats look like. Could you just make it two beds in the back and all sorts of stuff. So it, it's just a really exciting time. It, it really is. And it, it does completely change the game. I mean, you, you want to have people facing each other or should they be looking away? Should the interior of the car be a big entertainment center where I'm looking at movies or videos or the limo got it right the whole time. We just need all, we just need limos. <laughs> I think so. How does this all fit into what you're working on with 5g technology? I mean, I'd imagine that obviously everyone is working on 5g, but the way that this fits into cars, it seems like, could be one of the biggest game changers other than airlines, which I think we all agree that we want better Wi-Fi on as we're flying 30,000 feet into the air. But, but it, with regards to cars, it seems like 5G could be one of the biggest game changers. 5G could be a big game changer for, for cars in the space of um, vehicle to 
vehicle communications. Um, we call this V to V. Sometimes we use the term V to X. So it, it could be vehicle to vehicle. It could be vehicle to pedestrian. It could be vehicle to bicyclist. But this is the notion that each car will have a radio, so a radio uh, a transmit receiver on board. And the range of this would be kind of short range, maybe one kilometer or less. And that each car can exchange information with other cars that say, this is my geographic location. This is my speed, my rate of travel. I'm accelerating, I'm decelerating. This is the weather condition. These are the surface conditions in my immediate surrounding area. And it really creates an opportunity to, to provide much more awareness to the driver to say, hey, look, there's a critical situation ahead of you. Why don't you be prepared for this? So, so maybe two use cases could be if you're pulling up to a corner, maybe a four-way stop, and that uh, one of the corners is partially obscured by building. So there's a car there, you just can't see it. If I have V2V communications, even though it's not line of sight, each car can say, hey, look, I'm coming up on your right. I'm approaching at five miles per hour. We're now 15 feet away. Be prepared. You know, either stop or yield or at least be ready for me. Maybe another situation would be if you're driving a car and there's a car in front of you, but there's another car in front of you, but you can't see it because it's, it's down around a bend and it's going downhill. So if I have V2V communications, I can, I can determine that that car a mile ahead of me, but just down around the corner is decelerating or that perhaps it's stopped. And having this information to the driver to say, hey, look, there's a critical situation coming up ahead of you, but you can't see it yet, so be ready, would be very valuable if you compare that with how we drive today. So you have two hands on the wheel and we simply respond to the brake lights that are in front of us. I mean, it really creates some great opportunities for safe driving. But the important thing there is you need lots of cars to have this V2V capability on it. And, and so 5G can create that opportunity for us. All right. It is time for the end of our interview, unfortunately. But we have the lightning round still to go. These okay. are lightning fast questions. Dare I say fast is a Formula E car. And they're fast and easy, just like the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. Most fast and easy experience to build mobile apps. Are you ready for the lightning round? I'm ready. Number one, what app are you using on your phone that is the most fun? iHeartRadio. Great way for me to relax, re-energize when I'm working out or traveling. I love it. Man who loves podcasts, always, always a fan. Uh, or, or, or radio. On-demand radio. What's your favorite time-saving tool? Uh, I use Skype on a daily basis. So this is great for like global companies like ours. This is how we stay connected without traveling and they have instant messaging. So Skype is my, that's my time saver. Do you have a favorite use of AI or chatbots that you've seen recently? I stay away from chatbots. <laughs> 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 I avoid them at all costs. Do you have a favorite team sports or otherwise? I do. I grew up playing baseball, and my hometown team is the Detroit Tigers. And I love to go to games in the summer. All right. That's good. Hillary uh, worked with the Yankees for a long time. Our producer, Hillary, shout out to producer Hillary. So, uh, and I'm an A's fan, so we got some, some AL rivalry. I like it. Very cool. Let's go. <laughs> do you have a favorite podcast or recent book that you've uh, listened to or read? A recent book I read was called The Legends Club by John Feinstein. And this is a book about the three legendary college basketball coaches in North Carolina. So this is Dean Smith at North Carolina, Mike Krzyzewski at Duke, and Jim Valvano used to be at North Carolina State. So Mike Krzyzewski is great. He went to West Point, as did I. And uh, I got the chance to meet him a few times when I was there because he started a, a leadership series. He's incredible, but the unknown thing that is great that a lot of people don't know that I'm sure you read in the book is that Bobby Knight was his coach at Army. And the stories, when they get up together and are telling stories, it is one of the funniest things. Because you think of Mike Krzyzewski as the most like kind of buttoned up guy and, uh, and him and Bobby Knight going at it is pretty great. Oh, fantastic. Some great stories about Jim, Val Jim Valvano also. It's really... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You have applied for three patents. Is that right? Uh, I have two patents. Oh, you have two patents. I've been awarded two patents, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about this? This isn't lightning-y, but it's so interesting that we, we had to, had to uh, throw it in. 
Okay. One of the patents was really interesting. So way back in the early, let's say early 90s, when you wanted to change software on a car computer, like an engine control computer, you had to replace you had to replace the entire box. So you actually have to open up the hood and you take the box out and replace it with a, a new ECU or a new engine control computer. I worked on, uh, with a colleague, I worked on flash, so implementing flash memory in these engine control computers. So after our invention went into production, now you could just connect a diagnostic tool to the diagnostic port and you could reprogram the software in the engine controller without replacing the box. And so this was one of, um, this was really first in the industry. It was really a heck of a lot of fun to do. We did some software design. We did some hardware design, but it became game changing for the industry. And nowadays uh, they don't replace ECUs on cars. They just reprogram them. That's remarkable. Wow. It's so interesting. Do you find, you know, as a CTO and, and VP that is, has these, you know, extremely technically proficient skills, have you found that that's something that was, a struggle for you to try to, you know, lead folks when you just kind of want to maybe do it yourself? Or was that something that really allowed you to understand what the rest of your team was doing and be, be able to kind of poke and prod and, and ask the right questions? I think more of the latter is um, having a good technical background was also, um, you know, I had a good feel for the problem solving process. And so whether you're solving technical problems related to a project or you're just trying to think of how would I use that technology to improve the quality of our products or to advance the state of the art. I think having a technical background was really, really helpful in that regard. Yeah, there are many times where I miss rolling up my sleeves and, and uh, doing some of the work, but I also enjoy maybe sitting back a little bit and pondering for a moment to say, well, how could we use this new technology in our business? So I, re I really enjoy that. I, I enjoy kind of zooming out a little bit and thinking about where we're we going in, in the industry. What's your best advice for a first-time CTO? As a, a CTO, I think, I think we may try to do too much, or as a, a new CTO, we try to do um, maybe too many initiatives or there are too many fronts that you're trying to tackle. And I think the best advice I could give is pick your one or two items that you're going to work on for the next year, whether it's um, talent or it could be succession pipeline or it could be the capability of your, of your organization, um, or it may be unrelated to talent. Maybe it's just related to technology is, are we doing, you know, do we have our antenna up and do we have our radar out? So I think it's pick one or two things to really focus on for that first year or two. And, and then you kind of get a feel for, okay, what's next. I, I just, I think you should avoid trying to do everything all at once. Great advice for anyone, really. I love it. Last question for the lightning round. What is your favorite one day getaway in the Detroit area? There's a world-class museum in the Detroit area called the, it's now called the Henry Ford. And this was, um, there are two aspects of it. There's the indoor museum, which uh, has things like uh, the presidential cars over the years. So it has President Kennedy's car and it has President Roosevelt's car and it has President Reagan's car. Oh, that's cool. It also has things like the chair that Abraham Lincoln was sitting in at Ford's Theater the night he was he was shot. But but it's a it's really all about Americana, whether it's cars or airplanes or technology related to all things Americana. And and so this is like a, a six hour event. You go to this museum and you spend the whole day there. So going to the Henry Ford is one of my favorite things to do. Wish I did it more frequently, but it's a world-class museum. It's a great place to go. That is awesome. I love it. I highly encourage our listeners to go check that out. I will next time I'm in Detroit. I'm going to Chicago, but not not quite close enough to Detroit. I always want to go to uh, to the uh, Midwest when it's the middle of winter. That's my, <laughs> that's my go-to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Alan, thanks so much for hanging out today. Any, anything we missed? Ian, I think those were the big things, uh, but I would like to uh, thank you. It was very enjoyable. It was a lot of fun speaking with you today. Yeah, this was great. Thank you to, to all of our listeners uh, for hanging out as always, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be back real soon. Thank you again to our friends at Salesforce. IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. 
Salesforce just introduced the Lightning Platform Mobile, the low-code mobile app development platform that empowers anyone to easily build, publish, and manage AI-powered mobile apps for employees and for customers. Find out more at salesforce.com slash build mobile apps.